Amen. I, I truly thank you. I must admit that you did surprise me. I just was about ready to preach now. I, you know, they, they got me ready to preach. You understand what I mean, don't you? There's a certain rhythm in a church service, and uh, that song had me about ready. Y'all threw my rhythm off a little bit, but I'm going to try to catch it again and, and move to the Word. What do you say? I, uh, I think it ought to be said that we recognize that there are a lot of people who love us and pray for us all the time. You should know that we need your love. You don't know how many problems we have to face. I know that pastoring a church looks easy. I know that. But you don't know how hard it is. And I know some folk think that if you treat a pastor too well, that he'll get the big head and, and you won't be able to deal with him. But I got some news for you. There are enough trials to balance off any goodness you could do. I promise you that. And when you show us love, it, it is more than just saying I love you. It's an encouragement to go forward and do God's work. I thank God for a good wife. Not just any wife. My wife and I have been together almost 20 years. This year we will celebrate 20 years together. And somebody less than my wife could not have gone through all the trials that we've been through. But she's been right there and she hasn't wavered and I thank God for her. Now, I want to also thank the men in the sound room for this microphone today. Amen, church. Amen. Turn with me, if you will, to Deuteronomy, the 34th chapter. I got a sermon today and I'm about to run out of time. You sitting on these funny chairs and uh, I know somebody's going to want to get up and go. And I've gotten to the age now where it's hard for me to preach less than an hour. I try too. You don't know how hard I try. Some Friday nights I take three or four pages out of my notes. But something still happens. So y'all pray with me today. Would you do that? I, I have made a pledge to the Lord that I will never preach anything that doesn't do me any good. When I'm studying it, if it doesn't help me, I won't preach it to you. So it gets me excited. And you have to forgive me because I get excited when I'm studying the word. And then when I get ready to preach it, I try to cut it down, but it just does something to me. So if you got another appointment, you do like the old folks used to do in them little churches and hold one finger up and sneak on out today because I got to preach this sermon. <laughs> Let me read just two verses out of Deuteronomy 34, verses 5 and 6. So Moses, the servant of the Lord, died there in the land of Moab according to the word of the Lord, and he buried him in a valley in the land of Moab over against Beth Peor, but no man knoweth of his sepulcher unto this day. I have entitled our study for this day, I, I have been to the mountaintop. I've been to the mountaintop. Let us bow our heads as we pray. Father, Father, bless us now. There are too many trials that we go through during the week to come to Sabbath and miss a blessing. And so, Lord, I beg of you to touch my mind and to touch my lips. I have already given you my soul, all that I am and all that I possess. And I've asked you, Lord, to move me out of your way so that your word can go forth. Now, Lord, in the moments that we spend with thy word, let me not get in your way, but speak through me somehow. And those very things that you said to me in my study, those very things that you touched me with on my knees, Lord, let them be clear today as I stand in this pulpit. Let the same power that made my heart tremble, let the same power that put goosebumps on my skin, let it do something for somebody today. And when this blessing shall have been received, we'll give God all the glory and the honor and the praise. In Jesus' name, let everyone say, Amen. Amen. Today I am speaking to you about the death of Moses. Now most of us recognize the words, I have been to the mountaintop, 
Atlanta is famous for Martin Luther King, and Martin Luther King is probably famous for those words. But many of us don't recognize where these words have come from, and this is the very story that Dr. King referred to when he said those words. Now let me share with you the occasion. The presence of God had come down over the tabernacle. There was a cloud that followed the children of Israel by day, and it came over the tabernacle, and God called Moses and Joshua, and he said to Moses, Moses, you will sleep with your fathers. The Bible says that Moses begged God not to let him die. Moses had been with these people all the way from Egypt. He had been up to the brink of Canaan and had to go back for 40 years and came back again. And God said, Moses, you cannot go over, but you've got to die. So Moses said, Father, please let me go over. God said, Moses, don't even talk to me about it again because you will have to sleep with your fathers. So bring me Joshua and bring him to the tabernacle and I will transfer the leadership authority from you to Joshua. Now, friends of mine, you must understand why God did this. Psalm 106.33 has the answer. The Bible says that Moses spake unadvisedly with his lips. Now, most of us think it was because Moses struck the rock for the second time. But the fact is that God does not like it when your mouth says the wrong word. Are you listening to me? There are times when all of us get angry. There are times when all of us would like to give somebody a piece of our mind. But God knows the words that you say. It was not so much that Moses struck that rock the second time. And understand that Moses probably ruined one of the greatest symbols in the history of the Bible. For you see, Jesus was the rock. And the first time that Moses struck the rock, it represented the crucifixion of Jesus. But after that, Jesus would not go back to the cross again. And after that, all you had to do was to get on your knees and pray to Jesus. And everything you needed would come from him. So the first time the rock was to be smitten and the second time it was to be spoken to. Because today you and I don't have to crucify Jesus again. He's already been to the cross. There's a fountain filled with blood drawn from Emmanuel's veins. And all you've got to do is to talk to Jesus and the blood of Jesus is applied to your sin. So Moses ruined that symbol. But the sin of Moses was not the act of striking the rock. The sin of Moses was getting so mad at the people that he said the wrong thing. Now I understand that. I understand that. There are times when your lips want to go ahead of God. There are times when all leaders come to a place where they have had enough. Moses was out there with those people all of that time and instead of them saying, praise God, we're getting ready to get some water, they started fussing again. And Moses kept on hearing that fussing. They should have been praising. You see, they had history behind it. And friends of mine, don't you know that there's no reason in the world why we ought to complain? I don't care what you're passing through today. You've got enough history to let you know that God will answer your prayer. I don't care what trial you're going through. You ought to be able to praise God through that trial because of the way that God has already delivered you. These folk knew what happened when Moses struck that rock the first time. And when Moses went over to that rock again, they should have been standing up there moving like this saying, Praise the Lord. Thirsty, but ready for it to come. And when they saw Moses go over towards it, they should have said, come on, water. Come on out. But instead, they said, I'm thirsty and I don't know what we're going to drink. Moses got mad and he said, I'm sick of y'all. Are you still with me? Now, the folks were wrong, but Moses wasn't supposed to say that. And so in his anger, he took up that rod and hit that rock. But his mouth got him in trouble. Are you still with me? Folks, you got to be careful what you say. 
There are some of us who talk like talk is nothing. I know people say talk is cheap, but talk is expensive. Talk kept Moses out of Canaan. Talk is going to keep some folks out of the kingdom. Talk is going to run some of us to an early grave. Talk will get you in trouble. Are you listening to me? Be careful what you say. So Moses cannot go and he's standing up there watching this young man Joshua take over Israel because of his mouth. And if he could have gone back and gotten those words back, if he could have put him back in his mouth, he would have done anything to get those words back. But once you say words, they can't be taken back. Husbands, be careful what you say to your wife. Are you still with me? When you get mad, shut up. I know what I'm talking about. She may forgive you, but 20 years later, she'll say, I remember. Wives. When you get hungry, when angry, shut up. I know those books say you ought to talk it out. Don't you listen to those books all the time. When you are angry, shut your mouth. Wait until you cool down because you can't take words back. They are like needles strewn in haystacks. You can't get them back. And once you say them, people never forget what you say. So, so watch what you say. Are you listening to me? And somebody talked to me the other day, and I was I was angry, and they couldn't understand why I wouldn't talk to them. They they didn't know. I had some stuff floating around in my brain, and I said, "Lord, help me to shut up." Are you listening to me? Now I can talk to them now because I'm all right. But if I had opened my mouth that day, you would have heard about what I said. You don't understand what I'm trying to say. Shut your mouth. There are times when your mouth can stay shut. The world won't stop turning because you don't say something today. Shut your mouth. In fact, the Ellen White says the reason why most of the troubles are in the church today is because of people's tongues. Sixty percent, sixty-six to percent to be exact, of the problems in the church are caused by people's tongues. Some folk can't quit talking. They got to make a comment on everything. Are you listening to me? Just be quiet. Moses couldn't get him back. So now he stands up there and God says, you can't go. But now, Joshua, I put my power on you. And he said, Moses, go and introduce him to the people. Now, let me tell you, you got to have some humility to do that. You led him all the way through the wilderness. You can remember somebody's grandchild. And you can see now the granddaddy reflected in the grandson. And they're almost about to go over, but you can't go over. you got to die on this side. Moses went out there and said, I want to put my blessing on this young man, Joshua. And he will be your leader, and I will not. And Moses turned around, and alone, alone, he had to climb Mount Nebo to the heights of Mount Pisgah. Nobody could go with him. Now, let me tell you something. They wanted to go with him now. See, folks don't like you when they're supposed to like you. I just said something. You don't miss your water till your well runs dry. Moses had been talked about and cursed and criticized. And some folks said, oh Lord, they're taking Moses. He was such a good man. They had cursed him all day, every day, until he left. And now they say, we want to go with him. Folks, let me tell you something. Tell people you appreciate them while you can. Moses turns around to walk away and some of those same tongues that had cursed him every day said, Oh Lord, don't take him. In fact, if God had not hidden the place where Moses was buried, some of those same hypocritical rascals would have gone and built up a monument to Moses. Those same liars, those same criticizers, those same folks who had made his life miserable would have built a big old tabernacle over his tomb. So God said, I ain't going to even let you find where it is so you hypocrites won't be around here fooling with it. Well, I'm preaching whether you like it or not. So, so Moses turns now and he goes up into the mount and he goes alone. And those folks sit up there and they start weeping, you know. Oh, I wish, I wish I hadn't said that to Moses. I have been at some funerals. Listen to me now. 
I have been at some funerals where loved ones climb in the casket. Yeah. Yeah. Climb in the casket. No, don't take my mom. No, don't take my dad. No, don't take my husband. No, don't take my wife. Folks, I've learned something. If you treat folks right while they're alive, Amen. you can handle it when they die. Amen. Now, I'm not going to accuse everybody who ever climbed in a casket of being unkind. But I found out something. Those ones who are mean while you're alive, if you ever die, they go crazy. Then they get up there and start telling lies over you. Don't fool with me now. I told you the truth. You know, I was talking to him on the phone the other night, just before he died. One day, lightning going to strike somebody out of a pulpit. I tell my wife sometimes, I wish that man could get up out of that thing and say, No, you didn't. You ain't called nobody. But everybody made peace before they died. You know what I'm talking about, don't you? You know, we were not friends when he was alive, but mysteriously he called me Wednesday night and we got everything straight. And I just want you to know that the Lord going to strike somebody down and you're going to have two funerals <laughs> one day. But, but the mile, the man turns and he's walking up the mountain and, and Israel mourns for 30 days about a man that they, they taunted and criticized for 40 years. I got some news, 30 days won't make up for 40 years. 30 days will not suffice for 40 years. And 30 days of blessing when you can't hear it will not make up for 40 years of cursing when you can. So, so the man goes now. Now, folks, here is the beautiful, beautiful thing about it. God had to teach a lesson. And I got to talk about these lessons fast. You see, if God had let Moses go on, what kind of church would we have today? There's some folks who think now that you can do anything you want to and go on. But I got some news for you. The board may never catch you. The pastor may never know. The elders may never find out. The deacons may never suspect it. And the deaconesses may never hear about it. But God knows what you're doing. My Bible says be sure your sins will find you out. God will give you time to get straight, but if you don't get straight, God will put your business in the street. Now, I know what I'm talking about. Elder Furlow could tell you about a man one day. He and I know this man who came in my office and told me, I'm doing it, but you ain't going to catch me. And I got news for you. When the Lord got through with him, everybody had caught him. You see, the Lord gives you time. There's somebody listening to me right now. And I want you to don't even change the expression on your face. get right. And if you would go ahead and straighten up now, God would never put your business in the street. But you keep on doing what you're doing. And one day God will put your business on the front page. One day God will put your business on television. One day God will put your business on the radio. God is not not whatsoever man soweth that shall he also reap. So, so God can't let you keep on sinning. And because Moses was so high as a leader, God had to make an example of him. And so God proved three things. Number one, he proved that God is no respecter of persons. Some folks think that if you're high enough, you can gloss on over. I got news for you. The law is the law for the highest one and the lowest one. The law is the law for the president of the United States and the law is the law for the ditch digger. The law is the law for the pastor and the law is the law for the one at the back of the pew. The law is the law. I don't care how you apply it. God applies it the same way. So God had to show that Moses, as high as he was, still had to be punished for his sin. Are you listening to him? Number two, God had to show that past blessings do not suffice. Some folks think that the, that the word of God is like a bank. And if you do enough stuff good, 
you can build up for future times. <laughs> I've heard people say it, you know, they're doing something wrong and you go to them and they say, yeah, but you know, we've been serving this church for 30 years. Make no difference. Moses had been leading the children of Israel for 40 years. Made one mistake. See, past blessings don't have anything to do with your present problems. Somebody come in here and only been in the church a week and catch up with you. Your history is not anything that saves you so that you can be above the law. So you go ahead and tell other people and let them get impressed by your uncle laid the bricks in Berean. But God isn't impressed by that. God laid the foundation under the mortar, under the bricks, and made the mortar, made the clay that made the bricks. So don't go try to impress God with what you did way back yonder. Before the beginning was, God was. You can't impress him with years of service or deeds of distinction because God can outdo you on both counts. So God had to show number two that past blessings do not suffice. I hear people talking about what they used to raise in in gathering. Question is, what you doing now? I used to go out and bring people to church. What you doing now? I used to sing in the choir. Why are you sitting in the pew now? Folks, God not worried about what you used to do. That's your blessing. What you do now is what counts. Is anybody listening to what I'm saying? Number three, God had to show you that God means what he says. He means what he said. There's some folk who think, well, you know, I know that's there. But God don't mean that. How could a good God do that? <laughs> You're going to be surprised. <laughs> You're going to be surprised. God will get you now. Hmm? And somebody out there now got a disease that you caused on yourself. Sneaking, doing something. See, sneak. Sneak, and ain't nobody catching you. What you didn't know was the sin was catching you while you were doing it. Sin is its own trap. And, and you will survive for that, even though nobody knows. And then you'd be surprised how many people know, but I'll leave that alone. <laughs> Amen. So Moses turns now, and he goes up into that mountain. Now, I want to talk now. You may think this is a negative sermon, but it's not. It's a positive one. You see... Once God straightens the record out, and he's going to do that, God is going to set the record straight. But once he does that, God is a God of mercy. Now Moses goes up there and doesn't know what's going to happen. Climbs up that mountainside knowing that this is the last time. He turned his back on those children of Israel who he'd walked with and talked with and fussed with and had all kinds of altercations and he turns around and walks on up the mountain and up there he met Jesus. I'll prove it to you in a minute. I got a text for it. I'm not even going to the spirit of prophecy. I got a text for you. And when he got up there, Jesus said, Moses, I got something to show you. You're not going to go into Canaan but come on up here to the top of Pisgah, and I want to show you something. Now, now, there are those who think that what Jesus did was to take him up on the mountain so he could look down on the land. But that's not what he saw. What Moses saw was more like a panoramic motion picture. Because he saw things that were not yet. See, God doesn't deal in now. He knows what's happening now, but he knows the end from the beginning. So you and I are limited to the now. Amen? Amen. At the end of this sermon, I'm going to make an appeal and somebody's going to say, I'm not coming now. I'm going to come later. You can't even decide about later because all you control is now. But God lives in the now and in the future. To him, yesterday and tomorrow are the same because he's not limited by time. So God said, Moses, let me, let me show you something. Look out there. And Moses looked at Canaan, not as it was, but as it was going to be. Now, let me run through what Moses saw for you. And I get excited. See, some of you folks have lost your imagination because you've been looking at TV too long. 
And if it doesn't come on a screen, you can't understand it. But we are an imaginative people. You know that, don't you? Do you know that they have done studies and they found out that black folk think in pictures? And don't let anybody bother you with that because that's a wonderful thing. Other folk, some are so boring and bland that they think in words. Some think in, in formulae. Some think in, in logic. But we think in pictures. Think about it. Don't you? Can't you see stuff? And you see it exciting? In fact, over in Africa, there are some people whose job it is to tell stories, to exaggerate them so that other black folk can listen to them and see pictures. And they sit down there and say, oh, uh, uh, uh. See if some other people came up there and say, what are they all excited about? They wouldn't understand it because they don't think like we think. But we have the advantage of thinking in pictures. Now, I happen to notice some other folks do too, but praise the Lord for them do. What do you say? But some folks don't see it. Now, look at this. God says, Moses, let me show you not Canaan now because it looked bad now, but I'm going to show you what Canaan's going to look like when the children of Israel finally get it straight. And God showed Moses the hills covered with the cedars of Lebanon. God showed Moses flowers and trees. God showed Moses olive branches planted. God showed Moses beautiful towns that had sprung up with golden, golden domes. God showed Moses the children of Israel taking over the land. God showed Moses Israel coming up to its full stature. Not only that, but the, movie, the moving picture began to move now. And he saw Jerusalem turning so good that it got proud of itself. And began to say, we don't need God. We are God's children. We are the children of Abraham. And then he watched as Jesus was born. Listen to me now. Jesus comes down as a baby in Bethlehem's manger. Moses saw a star that wise men followed. Moses saw the birth of Christ. Moses saw Jesus live his life. Moses came up to Gethsemane and recognized that one of those two who came from heaven to see Jesus was him. Moses saw the crucifixion and his heart pained within it. And he thought it was all over. But on the third day morning, Moses saw Jesus come forth from the tomb. Moses watched as the church began to grow. Moses looked at people as they began to stretch out their wings and spread the gospel. Moses saw us move into the age of the atom. Moses saw us move into cars, past trains. We saw us go into this very age. Moses saw past this day. Past this day. In fact, Moses began to see the troubles that are going to come at the end of time. Moses saw the shaking time come. Moses saw the Sabbath trampled down. Moses saw God's children holding on for dear life. Moses watched as Jesus put down his robes of priesthood and changed into his robes of kingship. Moses saw Jesus coming again and saw people being saved in the kingdom of God. Moses saw them on the way to heaven with Jesus. And then Jesus said, Moses, you don't seen enough. Do you understand what I'm trying to say to you today? So Moses saw it all. Now, the question is, why would God say you got to die and then show him the whole picture? And the answer is simple. While God is just, God is also merciful. God is just and merciful at the same time. And so he took Moses up and let him see the whole story. And then he let him go to sleep. Now, incidentally, folks, if you study the word, you too can see all that. Problem is, some of us is we don't look in the book. Folks, do you know if you read this book, you can see all that Moses saw? It's in here, isn't it? You can read all the way to the end and know what the end will be. And when you know what the end will be, you are not afraid of dying anymore. I go all the time to the bedsides of good Christians, and death does not frighten them. I went to a man's bedside in Cleveland, Ohio. The man called for me and he said, Pastor, I just got one thing I need to take care of. Tell my wife don't spend more than $2,000 on my funeral and tell her to put my blue suit on me in my casket. 
I said, brother, you, you, you can't give up. He said, pastor, I haven't given up. I have talked to the Lord. My sins are confessed. I'm all right with Jesus. And there's only two things I need you to do for me. And if you're willing to do that, I'll be all right. Before I got back home, the man had gone to sleep in Jesus. You think it's a terrible thing when you die in Jesus? It is not. It is not. Because once you've seen to the end, it's all right. Are you listening to me? Once you know what God is going to do. And so Moses lay down and the Bible says, well, let me give you the text now. You need to know it. Look in Jude 9. Now, if you read the text that was used for our scripture this morning, you recognize that in verse 6, it says, and he buried him. Now, if you back up to verse 5, it says Moses, the servant of the Lord, died there. The only other he who was on that mountain was Jesus. You can't die and then bury yourself. So there were two people on that mountain. There was one human being and one divine being. And the only he who was left after Moses died was Jesus. And the Bible says that God buried Moses on that mountain. That's all right with me. I don't know what my funeral is going to be like and don't much care. But I tell you, that's a way to go, folks. If you've got to have a funeral, let God be your funeral director. If you've got to die, let Jesus be in charge of your death arrangements. If you've got to close your eyes in death, let Jesus be right with you up until the end. And somehow I believe that Jesus will not leave you when you come to the end. If you believe it, can I hear you say amen? I don't worry anymore about death. Once I understood that Jesus will not leave you, then death does not frighten me. I don't worry about it because I know that if I keep my hand in God's hand, when I close my eyes in death, Jesus will be there. And so he was there and he buried him. But then something else happens and I'll close on this thought. Some of us are mixed up. We think that the one who's mad is Jesus and the one who's trying to help you is the devil. That's the opposite of what's true. My Bible says that God is not willing that any should perish, but that all should come to repentance. The one who wants you to miss heaven is the devil. In Jude 9, you will read this. Yet Michael, the archangel, that's Jesus, when contending with the devil. Can I pause there a minute? Contending means that they had an altercation that represented an argument. You see, if you read back in the Bible, you'll never find anybody who was resurrected before now. You go on back as far as you can. Start at Genesis and read up to Deuteronomy, and you won't find anybody who died and came back. The devil thought that the grave was his. The devil thought that when you died, you stayed dead. See, when, when Cain killed Abel... Abel stayed dead. And the devil smirked and said, when they die, they belong to me. But now, he was there when Moses messed up. Because the devil is always there when you mess up. The devil causes you to mess up. The devil writes down that you messed up. And he wants you to die because of your sin. The devil keeps an accurate record of all the sins you ever committed. And you get on your knees and say, Lord, forgive me. And God forgets about your sin. He says, I put your sin in the bottom of the deepest sea. I put them behind my back and remember them no more. I take them as far away as the east is from the west. I do that for you. But the devil gives you no such promise. He remembers every sin you ever committed. I just said something. The devil knows everything you ever did. So now when Jesus came back to that tomb where the devil was over there happy because he got Moses. And let me tell you something, the devil gets excited when he gets you and you die. You know, I got me one now. <laughs> Jesus buried him, but he can't have him now. The grave is mine. The grave is mine. But see, the devil didn't understand that Jesus' power is retroactive. Now, you're too tired to even fool with this now, but let me try it. 
Remember when Jesus came out of the tomb? He said, I have the keys. <laughs> I have the keys of death and the grave. He said, I can get in there when I want to. See, that's what keys mean. Amen? Amen. Keys won't help you if you can't get in. Jesus said, what you don't know is since I have died and been resurrected, I am the author of life that can come out of death. In fact, he had proof with him. There were some folk who were in the tomb when Jesus died on the cross and they came alive. Came alive and walked around in those tombs until Jesus came out on Sunday morning. And when Jesus came out, they came out with him. They were proof that Jesus had power over the grave. So the power of Jesus being retroactive reached all the way back through the Old Testament and came back to Exodus and dropped right there. And Jesus came over to that grave and used the keys that he would have when he died. Y'all don't understand me because if you did, you'd say amen. See, he knew he was going to have them, so he used them. And he came back to get most. And the devil said, well, what? What are you doing? What you come here for? You come to get him? That sorry rascal Moses? Uh-uh. He said he can't live again. When people sin, say, remember Jesus? You think the devil can't quote the Bible? Oh, well, he knows it better than you do. He said, remember what the Bible said? Romans 6, 23, the wages of sin is death. Bible ain't written yet, but when it gets written, that's going to be in Romans 6, 23. You can't get him up. And Jesus didn't even, didn't even argue with him. I like that. Sometimes you ought not argue with folks. If you've got the power, don't argue. If you ain't got the power, argue. But if you've got the power, go on and do what you're doing. Jesus comes back to the tomb. The devil says, you can't have him. Jesus said, I rebuke you, Satan. Satan came as the accuser of the brethren. The word in, in, the, in the Greek is hasatan. It's the accuser. See, the devil wants us to die and never come back again. But when you get your sins forgiven, the devil has no record of that. Because see, I can get down on my knees right now in front of you. Oh, I wish it was 12 o'clock so you could understand it. I could get down on my knees by that chair right there. And if I committed the worst sin in the world, I could ask the Lord to forgive me and you wouldn't know it. Lord, have mercy. You'd be sitting up there saying, he's a good man. And what you didn't know was I'd do something horrible. But the Lord never let you know about it. I'd just get it straight with him. And God would take that sin. Where's the deepest part of the sea? Let me find it. Take that sin put it down there. Fathoms. Fathoms underneath the sea. Say, I don't remember that anymore. So if I came the next day and said, Lord, forgive me of doing that, he said, what? Come on, folks, try to help me out now. Say what? Say, well, Lord, you know, I, I stole tithe from you last week. What tithe? Well, Lord, last week I was supposed to put an honest tithe and offering in, and I didn't do it. I robbed you. And then I ask you to forgive me. Well, when you ask him to forgive you, he forgave you. And he doesn't remember it anymore. So if you keep bringing it up, that's your fault. Do you understand what I'm saying? And you, you can kneel down by the side of your husband and confess the worst sin in the world, and your husband may never know. You can kneel down by the side of your wife and confess the worst sin in the world. They may never know. Because God forgives sin in private if the sin was private so Moses has got it straight but the devil doesn't know it so when Jesus comes to get some devil said no you ain't getting him <laughs> you can't have it. he said he he disobeyed you see the devil will come and tell you to disobey God and he'll be the one to bring it back up you see what I'm saying he'll say don't you put your tithe in there he said okay then you're going to be surprised one day when he will bring it up and say, don't you remember on Sabbath, September the 5th, 
when Pearson was in there and should have given his time and didn't put one cent in there. I remember I was there. And you say, but wait a minute, you were the one who told me not to do it. I don't know nothing about it. All I know is you didn't do it. Or the devil will tell you to go down to some dark street, to the no-tell motel. outside the church today who ought to be in the church today but they won't come back into church today because the devil tells them ain't no use in you going in you're lost you're a sinner and all they would have to do would be to get on their knees and say Lord forgive me and Jesus would cleanse them of their sin but it's a devil who won't let you forget God doesn't remember it anymore and so the devil said no I remember when he was supposed to speak to that rock, he struck the rock. He can't come up, but I'm so glad that Jesus is on my side. Jesus did not argue with him. He said, rebuke you, devil. Oh, Moses wakes up by the power of God. He sees the devil standing over in one corner and Jesus standing over the other. He knows what happened. <laughs> he knows what happened. Lord said, come on with me, son. We're going home. The devil said, no, 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 no. And all the time he said, no, 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 no. They flying on up back to hell. Are you listening to me? The devil has no power over Jesus. That's why the devil will try to keep you set in your seat. The devil will try to keep you frozen in your sin. Because if you get straight with God, there ain't nothing the devil can do to keep you out of heaven. Oh, praise God. Praise God. The devil will come up with a book this thick. He can't go. I remember when he did such and such. You mean you're going to keep me out of heaven and take him? You can't take him. But the same Jesus who said rebuke him then will rebuke him again. Folks, when Jesus comes back, the devil going to have him a time. He's going to have imps with, with all kind of books. <laughs> you know, and then when Jesus comes down here, the Bible says that, the, that a trumpet of God shall sound. And the dead in Christ shall rise first. The devil going to get upset and say, what's going on here? Who is these people? What, what's happening? And he's going to say, go get the books. Go find the sins. They can't come. Jesus said, rebuke you, Satan. And angels are going to go down and pick up God's children and bring them on up. And they're going to meet with God on the cloud in the air. And the devil going to be down there saying, but, 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 but. And the whole time he's saying, but, 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 the cloud going to lift on up. Lift on up. He said, but they sin. He said, yeah, they sin, but they confess their sin. They sinned, but they got everything right. And they have been washed in the blood of Jesus. Why do you think at the end of the Bible it says that somebody's going to cry out and say, Who are these folks coming up here with white robes on? And the Bible says they have come through great tribulation. But they washed their robes and made them clean in the blood of the Lamb. The only way you're going to get to heaven is to be washed in the blood of Jesus. But if you are washed in the blood, the devil can't stop you 
Lord, I hope it's play. I hope it's play. Now today I'm about to close this sermon, but I know something. Some of us need to get some stuff straight with the Lord. Problem with the church today is we got too many folks with little hidden stuff. Sitting around worried about who's going to find out. Well, there's one way to fix that up, you know. Just quit doing it. Huh? Then let them tell on you. You see, after that prodigal had been out there in that pigsty, you remember that? And, and he comes back. Look at that, I got to move. Oh, Alabama preacher got to move every now and then. The, the prodigal comes out of that pigsty, stench all over him, and he's on the way home. And that thing would have scared me if that boy had had to walk up to that house with that filth on him. Because I don't know about you, but I have sinned and come short of the glory of God. I've been in some stuff that I'm ashamed of. Haven't you? Have you done some stuff you're ashamed of? I hear some folk around telling you, I used to do this. Folks, I've done some stuff I ain't going to tell you about. I'm going to just tell Jesus that's what I'm going to do. And I don't want you to know it. I'm not going to bring it up. God forgot it. I forgot it. The devil can do what he wants to do. But, but, but that boy, if he had walked all the way up to that house and dirt, dirty, that thing would have scared me. But I want you to know daddy was out there at that window looking. And when he saw that boy out there, he said, Lord, look at my boy. He's coming home. And he ran out there to his no good son. That no good boy. And took his robe off. Took it off. And put it on that boy. And said, son, you don't look too good. But my robe, see, has been on me. And this cologne that I got on is strong enough to cover the pig smell that's on you. Don't bother with me today, folks. The Lord told me to tell you this. The cologne on me is sweet enough to cover up the pig smell on you. And I'm going to put that on you. And I want you to put it all the way up to your neck. So they can't see what you used to look like. I want you to put it all the way down to your hands. So they can't see your arms, son. Pull it down to your leg. Don't cover yourself up. And now let's go home. And he walked that boy home. And those servants came out there and said, yeah, let's see what he looked like. He'd been gone a long time. And they went out there and looked at him real close. But they couldn't see his sin. They had been covered by the robe of the father. They smelled at him. See what he smelled like. But they couldn't smell where he had been because the cologne that was in the father's robe sweetened up the smell of where he had been. He covered him as he walked him back home. And I've got news for you. Jesus will put his robe on you. But he ain't going to put his robe on you while you hiding so. You got to confess it. There's some folk today who need to get some stuff right with Jesus. I'm wondering... I'm wondering if anybody, anybody in here today got a little bitty something. Now, if your pride's still working, you can't even deal with where I'm going now. So if your pride is still on, you can forget this. We're leaving you now. I wonder if there's anybody got a little something in your life that you're doing and you ought to quit. And today you're willing to give it to Jesus. Would you just stand up? Lord have mercy. I wonder if anybody in here today got a little something you ought to do, but you haven't been doing it, and you're willing to do it by God's grace. Would you stand up? A little something you should have been doing, but you haven't done it, and you're ready to do it now. Would you stand up? I wonder if there anybody today who would be willing to claim the righteousness of Christ and accept his role and just feel good. You know half the problem with church members is that we feel bad so we want to make other folks feel bad. I don't know about you but I feel pretty good today. I've sinned but I'm straight. Incidentally while I'm preaching you can say your prayer. Keep your eyes open if you want to. Close them if you want to. Say Lord forgive me for that. Don't play with it now. Don't say if I have. You know you did. Close your eyes if you need to. Keep them open if you want to. Say, Lord, forgive me for it and watch. See if God will not cleanse you from unrighteousness. 
And if you're cleansed, what do you have to feel bad about? Anybody understand what I'm saying? Doesn't it try to kind of make you feel good to be straight with the Lord? If Jesus were to come at this very moment and all of my sins were confessed, I'd be saved according to what I read. Do you believe that? Do you believe that? So then, if I don't have anything to get straight, then I ought to feel good. Shouldn't you feel good? How many feel all right? Let me see your hand. If you don't feel all right now, I can't help you. I didn't nothing I can do for you. I'm wondering, is there somebody who needs to come to Jesus today? Somebody who needs to come down to the front and say, I need to be baptized, need to be rebaptized. But I know one thing, the devil can't keep me out of heaven because I understand that now. The devil may come and fuss and say, you can't take him. The devil may fuss and say, you can't take her, but the power of God is greater than the power of the devil. And I am going to be washed in the blood of Jesus. And I want to be ready when Jesus comes. I wonder if there's anybody who wants to be baptized or rebaptized. You want to come down and, and, and say, I want to learn about this church. And I want to be a member of it. Would you come out of your chair right now and come down to the front? I need you to do it right this minute.